can construct their design of land mass, they can determine what this and that is to be called, you see, or w w w what direction the, the uh, prescription for traveling from point A to point J, H, wherever. So at, at the point that they retranslated Moorish knowledge, and this was essentially the, the, the work of the Catholic church scholar. Okay. They, they retranslated the books that were used to teach them and the Yiddish, quote, Yiddish Jew, who <coughs> hurried over to Iberia when they found out that particularly, quote, Henry, the navigator, <laughs> wanted ships and maps so that he could get into West Africa because it was found out there was this enormous amount of gold in North Africa. That's the book titled The Golden Trade of the Moors by E. W. Bobble. talks about the Moors of West Africa. Most of the literature is about the Moors of North Africa as if only that little clump of dark-skinned, broad-nosed, thick-lipped folks were called Moors, okay? The golden trade of the Moors. I'm going to see if I can get Lucima to, to hunt that down. It's, it, it, it's, it was out of print back in the 80s, and they republished, reprinted it. W-E Bobble, B-O-V-I-L-L, the golden trade of the Moors. The other one is the golden age. Did he write both that? No. No, Ivan Van Sertima is the compiler of the Golden Age of the Moors. Okay, we're going to get started, and they'll just have to catch up. Uh, Lucimba, you want to come turn us on here? Oh, why didn't you tell me that? I mean, you were sitting wiping sweat off my face. No, I'm a movie star. <laughs> Got to go into my acting mode. Uh, this Gemini Rising, I'm always doing my drama. Why are you in Atlanta? Why are you in Fulton County? Why are you in the state of Georgia? The, the United States, the Western Hemisphere. Why are you on planet Earth? Why are you in this solar system? Why are you in the universe? Those are the seeker's questions in the silence. And the answer would easily come to get something from it. That's why you're here. Not to play and have a, a, a fun life like many get a chance to do. There are virtually those who have such karma that they come back just to enjoy themselves. But even there, that's still not the divine purpose or the divine intent. And the universe in its pre-knowledge, pre-cognition of our nature prepared something for us. And that's important for us to know. One of the blessings of reading this little book, the Kibalian, is that it tells you that there is this invisible that cares about you and will never stop caring, no matter what you do or don't do. It will always care about you, will always know exactly where you are and what you're doing. And always has great plans for you whenever you're willing to receive it. That's a wonderful idea, you know. It, it calmed me way down, man, when I read this little book, calmed me down. Because I was a paranoid wreck. <laughs> Left-wing socialist. Got my mind all tied up in knots. Self-knowledge. Having the form of godliness, but not according to accurate knowledge. I can't find that in, in, in uh, Paul's letter. I will, though, because I, I intend to quote it. But it's in there. It's in one of uh, Paul's letters, who was, is considered a metaphysical preacher. Okay, as you read his letters, and particularly the statement that's made, when I was a child, I fought as a child. I played as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now, the fundamentalist reads that and is comparing 
himself or herself as a Christian as opposed to children. That isn't what Paul is talking about. Because he's also the one who states, let us put aside the fundamental teachings of Jesus and be on with the teachings of perfection. <laughs> you know, the, the, the fundamentalist ain't going ain't, ain't to read that one to the congregation. <laughs> but when he said, when I became a man, master, able, and noble, then he had to quit believing child, childish ideas about God. He had to quit praying for somebody to help him. The master has to do it himself. See, his prayers become proclamations, declarations, and decrees. The difference between a spiritual being such as Paul and Jesus and that of a rabbi, preacher, or imam is that the, the master goes to the synagogue, to the church, or the masjid to work a miracle, not to ask for one. To heal somebody, not to get healed. <laughs> to give a revelation, not to get one. In this maturity we're talking about, this is where our mind is going. And we need to know what we are armed with, what we have as pluses that allows us to make the assumption, know ye not that ye are God. It's the 12 powers of man that allows us to make that assumption. And the first part of that symbological point of view is given basically on the clock, counting from 1 to 12 in terms of the full circle. Then, going directly to the scriptures, we keep noting these sets of 12s, the 12 sons of Ishmael, and the 12 sons of Jacob, okay? Most, in fact, Fillmore didn't even deal with the 12 sons of Ishmael. Then from that transformation, it's immediately moved to the 12 apostles. But it doesn't go there first. It goes, it actually goes to, or actually begins with Abraham who had crown of the head to the soles of the feet, head bent over backwards touching the feet, Pisces gives you the 360 degrees of the circle and the 12 parts equated by the 12 signs of the zodiac. If you look, I want you, before I get into these, I want you to look at the top of the crown. Look at that real carefully on, on that illustration I gave you. Pick it up and look at it. Everybody, let's see if everybody gets the, the revelation at the same time here. See how in tune you all are. Now, what else do you see besides the centers, the word, name, I, Christ, I am? What else is there that you see? Oh, there's something, look again, there's something there that's so subtle, if you don't take notes, you'll miss it. No, no you don't see no Pisces on there, my brother. On top of the head, look, look. Look with the eye of the artist. No, no, no. What kind of crown? No, she got the word right. What kind of crown? What kind of crown? It's right there in front of you. Don't y'all see this? 
No, no, no. Well, what, what, what the Moors? What does this mean? What, and then went from verbal language to sign language. <laughs> Thank you. Right there. And, and I don't know if Charles Fillmore drew that or not. But they took their knowledge from Egyptian literature, and that Charles Fillmore knew who the Moors were. There's no doubt in my mind about it though his dictionary is not to that complimentary end. But I re revert back. The man was a racist. You know? they, they have a white order. You know? Even though they preached and taught divine love as the center of the universe, still was a racist. Very interesting. I don't know how in the hell that could be. Except we're not supposed to be following a white god. That's the only conclusion I could come to. In fact, one of them, I think, they, I don't know if that was Max Heidel that made this comment, and a brother I met over at uh, Pasco said, uh, when I heard this minister tell this group of white people, he was the only colored guy in there that the black man was drafted off the white man he said he ain't been back since. <laughs> and he didn't know how we got here but he knew damn well that was wrong <laughs> but there is a natural divisionism you know and uh, it didn't become real in my mind until my, my, my brother showed me something in the spirit why that is I'm still not certain other than the fact our, our God parents are up there. That's the only reason I can think of. That it isn't all apple pie, everybody's going to the same place and we're all the same. And you know. No, shit, there's four divisions up there. There's four, four divisions. The, the, the plane of gold light, the plane of the white light, the plane of the green light, and the plane of the black light. Now those are just the twelve planes of heaven. That, that has, that's beneath the realm of supreme consciousness. And, and Theophili Obinga said, we came from the great fire, the primal energy that causes everything to come into existence. That, that, that those are not heavenly planes. Those are beyond heavenly planes. Without being braggadocio, what the information keeps revealing is we're, we're of the oldest souls in this universe. And we, we've had many trips down here, maybe too many. <laughs> but we're old, ancient, ancient, ancient souls. So maybe that has much to do with this divisionism, which doesn't bother me at all. I remember when Naeem Akbar was speaking, he says, anybody that's following Christians is going to end up following a white man forever, <laughs> even in heaven. <laughs> well, it got so quiet in there. It's at uh, Cleveland State University. You know, because probably half of them were Christians. You know. yeah. The purpose is not just to become enlightened. It is to become your own God. Lord of heaven and earth, and then Lord of the universe, See? where you have the spiritual authority to go anywhere in the universe you so desire. So at this point, the best most of us can do is, is get out there on the astral, and if we get on the wrong plane, we're going to get our butts kicked. Because some places you can't go unless you're invited or escorted unless you're as big as the souls on that plane. See, uh, L.C. Clark went out there, and they didn't bother him. And these, uh, he didn't tell me they were Europeans. I know they were, because I know what order he affiliates with. They were in the, the uh, etheric boats, which are royal blue and gold. They're boats. 
you know, Egyptian boats floating on the etheric waters. And uh, they waved at him, you know. And he said he wanted to get in. He just wouldn't let him. He just kept on going. He's an a astral traveler. A Moor who was a Mason. LC is probably still a Mason. But he's a very mature soul and, and hindered his ability of expression because he liked education. But he, he's, a, he's a spiritual doer, not much of a talker. Anyway, let's get back to where we're supposed to be. The first thing I want to point out, and I didn't bring it, uh, go back there and get uh, Emiola's Fez for me, please. We're going to start with the head because it is the God head we're talking about. And that's the head you're supposed to be putting on. That's the government that is to be up on your shoulders. Now, there is a spiritual being who is the G-O-D of each spiritual realm that sits on the shoulder of the disciple. But we're talking about individual development. The head you have on now is to become a God head. Okay, and I want to start off with the symbological representations before we get into that so that you know it's very real. Thank you very kindly. I wouldn't bring mine because I don't want to get water splashes on it. <laughs> but we're glad you brought yours, my brother. <laughs> okay, you can, you see those? Okay, okay. This is first called, named in, in transliteration, a Kez, is the ancient Kemetic word, K-H-E-Z, that, that was retranslated to Fez, which means crown. I'm waiting for a very remarkable picture of this as soon as Emiola Bay hunts through Brother Queasy's tapes and finds this photograph of, of uh, Pira uh, Thutmose's Hotep. I want you all to see a remarkable picture so that you know that the, the European Mason did not invent this. F E Z is the K H E Z. Kez. Yeah. The, the quarter is approximately the size of your crown chakras now. And they evidently, they get bigger than that, but they expand. This one is a little bit bigger. These are a little bit bigger than a quarter. But the four quarters equals what? 100. Four quarters equals one. Right. Yes. And what does that dollar bill, I'm, I'm in the wrong class here. Everybody reach in and get, get your dollar out. Let's go to dollar school here. I thought I did this once. I didn't. That was another class. At least I'm consistent in my approach here. Now just turn it, turn it on the back side. And what does that statement say there? One in God we trust. No, that ain't what it says. You got it all, but you did, gave it up backwards. In God we trust one. Yes, right. Yeah. And one is the equi equivalency of God, the concept one is the equivalency of God. The one they trust is on the front of the dollar bill. <laughs> now, did I bring my, uh, what you call it, because I wanted, I, your husband was supposed to come back here, and I made sure I brought this back with me. At least I better had, I did. Hold your dollar out there, because I want you to, it's important to get some visual evidence, because the subconscious, at a certain point, starts saying, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. That ain't, that ain't right. <laughs> that, that, that ain't right. <laughs> that ain't right. That, that can't be right. 
we, we think or have been trained to think so little of ourselves that it gets to be a, a, a chore for this to get down. Now, I want you to look at this face here and tell me what you see on that dollar bill. On the front, turn around on the front. Whose face? No, look, look, no, look, look and tell me what you see now, not, not what you think you see. Look at, look at the dollar and tell, describe what you see when you look at this and look at that picture. Thank you. Jo old George combed his hair like Farah Hamakas okay, to, to give the impression of the Godhead. Yeah, because you can't become president and stay there if you're not a Mason. Two of them tried it, Lincoln and Kennedy. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> I'll leave it up there for a minute. So these four centers on your head are not just in your astral brain. They're indentated in the very physical part of your brain. Okay, you can't see them because they're beneath the fiber of the brain. Those are the ones that lead to super consciousness, or is referred to as the Christ mind, as you see in, in the photograph there. Okay. But beneath those four, right at the top of your brain, which would be approximately here, if I got it marked here, yeah, here, the epiphysis gland is your ganglionic nerve gland that stimulates or is stimulated to awaken these four chakras. It's on the inside of your brain, at the top of your brain, referred to as the epiphysis gland. E P H. Let me see if I can remember it. I think now I'm going to recommend both these books. I think Catherine mentions it, or either Fillmore. This is the the healing secrets of the ages, and in this one. She gives uh, positions of the, the, the major organs and glands, okay? So I recommend them to be read simultaneously because there's some information in here that she didn't put in here and some information that she discovered later that's not in here. So it's to get a, a real understanding of those 12 faculties. It's good to have both books, okay? The Healing Secrets of the Ages by Catherine Ponder. They didn't get any of those in, I don't think. Hmm. Uh, well, it's been a while, I think, since they had him up here. Okay. And uh, today we're going to become aware of that gland at the top of your crown chakra. But, but when you feel a vibration in your brain that makes your eyes squint and head shake, that's that particular gland being stimulated, not the penal, not the pituitary. Okay. The, the, the penile gland vibrates when it awakens, and, and it looks like the tail end or the front end of a worm. You know, it'll be grayish, whitish looking. You know, usually gray because it's samskara on most of our faculties and, and brain. Dead thought is samskara, the stuff that kills the brain's faculties and nerve centers virtually what kills us. Okay. The twelve apostles, their names are equated with these spiritual centers. Now there are two factors here. Before they became apostate, they became disciples, which is the equation of discipline. The twelve disciplines are the twelve disciples, or vice versa, the twelve disciples are the twelve disciplines that each one of us must undergo to gain access to these 12 intelligences throughout the mind, from the crown of the head to the sole of the feet. Let me, I think we're, I want to make a very important point here. I think it's uh, Genesis chapter 11.
think. Let me check here. Chapter 11. Yeah, chapter, uh, Genesis chapter 11. Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. And it came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone, and they used tar for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower, whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Over the face of the whole earth. Okay. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech is not rep representative of God coming down and scattering the human race. It is a syllogistic representation of the power, the centered oneness of power in the devolution expression of the divine man becoming human, that these powers would work throughout his whole physical body instead of just in his consciousness center, just in the head. That's all it refers to. God really didn't come down and confuse everybody. <laughs> one language, one awareness, one knowledge, one understanding. Okay. It, it is reminiscent of divinity. I, I wanted somebody else to turn to their King James Bible because it reads a little bit differently, but nobody picked their Bible up. So let us go on. Yeah. Never mind. It's, oh, that's all right. Just, just, just hoping that might happen. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Very important key. Nothing they purpose to do would be impossible for them. Did you find it yet? Mm -hmm. All right, re read that, verse uh, uh, 6. Verse 6 in Yes, dear. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do, and nothing, and not nothing which they purpose to do would be impossible for them. Okay, you got the same translation I have. It reads a little bit different because there's a key word here that I want you all to hear and fasten on to that's very important in your spiritual work. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they began to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Real big key. Nothing that you imagine to do will be impossible. Whatever the mind conceives, Understand that what I just said, because conception exceeds belief. Conception is birth. If you give birth to an idea in your mind, your mind is going to produce it. Whatever the mind conceives, the mind will achieve. The importance of that is understanding that if you imagine a vain thing, Fearing someone is going to kill, rape, or rob you. That is vanity. It is beneath your divinity to think that someone else with the wrong intent is stronger than you who has the right intent. That's phobia. A false fear. An elusive fear. You know, Moors don't carry those around in their consciousness. Just as if you want, I almost said need, if you want something, desire something, 
imagine that you have it. That's how you get it. That's how you got everything you have now, including the bills. Important key, because you have a cerebral faculty in your brain that allows the power of your consciousness to work through your faculty of imagination. There's only one power. It works in 12 different variations and in 12 different places. That's what we're going to evaluate here. And I'm not going to spend the whole class on it uh, because I want you to buy the book and study the book, not to have some brief paragraphs from it. I heard about this book kind of thing. Okay. I'm trying to follow some kind of a plan here so the, the information in the this Morse inquiry you'll have access to because you're going to have a, a 87 inquiry. I, I refer to it as an inquiry but because the idea of taking a so-called test is to find out if you know what you've studied. That's its purpose, not to get a grade. Okay. Not only if you know it, can you recall it when you need to recall it? That's the other part. Okay. That's kind of what we're doing here. Okay. <clears throat> Let's go through the 12 faculties briefly here. Let me do this quickly. I'm trying to keep on putting all of this up on the board here, but maybe I need to do it. And I still, I'm going to try to stand up here and do with just what I said you're supposed to be able to do. I'm going to try to recall the 12 great seers, the thing that gets in the way. Okay, the first one I didn't put up it because I had it here, the Christ Center. Uh, the, the, the concept of the Christ Center virtually is, are the chakras on top of the head and the epiphysis gland represents that level of pure consciousness where not just the intuition works, but where you think from perfectly. The superconscious mind is a supraconscious intelligence. However, it doesn't work from up here. It works from another part of your brain. We won't get into that one because we're not going to deal with the, the grantees. Where, in fact, uh, Mahish Rahish Yogi has demonstrated it. He used to have professors and doctors come to him and ask him any question about anything and he would have the complete and perfect answer and would talk about it extensively. That's the supraconscious intelligence, which is cosmic consciousness. And that, that's your potential. But where we're trying to get to is superconscious mind. Okay, that, that's these brain faculties th throughout the body. Okay, the, remember the, the whole, the, bo the mind is throughout the entire body, not just in your head. That's your brain mind. Okay. Uh, faith, as you see up here, I have kres. That, that's the, the translation of this particular glyphic to show the Greek that Jesus was not a Greek if his name was given as Christ.
won't get too fancy here. That's the tear bed, which is called in <coughs> other languages and <coughs> the sarcophagus of Osares. When this blip is given, it means the risen Heru. Horus is Heru. Het Heru, twice risen, is Het. So th this particular hieroglyphic, this is, does that look like a bird to y'all or not? Okay, okay. The, the bird ru up over his tomb is the soul rising, okay? Is kres, or karais, which of course became Christos, Christe, and then Christ in the Greco-Latin language. It does not mean anointed one, it means mummified, crowned, and anointed. In the ceremony of the risen one, each initiate went through, they would wrap him in mummy cloth and then place a papyri of a spiritual statement under each wrapping and anoint it. And of course, he would have his crown on, which signified the risen one, okay? as a symbological representation of rising from the dead, the resurrected one, okay? the rising savior. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's, it's Kres. It's translation, translation. So Christos works, except it doesn't put it in our, our house. This is our house. Okay. Starting at the top of the head, Will is Matthew, and another important factor uh, about consciousness. You already have will power. The problem is you have too many things you want. Your desire nature is scattered into too many different places. If you wonder why you can't lift a flame off a candle or move the glass across the room, sort of, because your energy of will power, which is desire. Understand what will power is. Here, folks, in a, I ain't got no will power. I won't. I won't. I, you know, they're talking about their will power, but it's scattered. When you can focus it on one thing, then it gains its potency, and you're able to narrow in on it in your mind. <laughs> not out here. You, you don't look out there and say, I want that. You look in there and say, I have that. <laughs> and focus your attention and your desire for that thing. Then you'll experience the power of your will. If you can get your glands to say yes when you want and no when you don't, you'll demonstrate your will power. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Well, I want to mention a couple. I'm going a little too slow than I intended to. Understanding is Thomas. These are a part of the front part of the brain, the part of the conscious brain area where we deal with on a day-to-day -day hourly basis. We're constantly dealing with our intellectual uh, uh, juggling of interests, needs, wants, desires, questions, answers, that kind of mental muddle. Faith Peter, this, the word faith comes from this word, phodius, it's in the dictionary, it does not mean believe, it means confidence, towards, uh, no, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, faith is the substance, stop, period, faith is a substance. that flows from this faculty into your, your brain chemistry. It is a liquid light. It flows from here all the way down to your feet. The first time I saw it, I, I could see it in my ankle. And you get this overwhelming feeling you can do anything, because that's what it represents. 
the power to do anything, the reassurance, the confidence in the God within yourself, not your ego, okay? And, and, and it, when you get it, that's where the battle starts because the ego starts saying, it's me. I am God. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> look, look out. Because <laughs> it's going to trick you. It gives you a chance. Okay. Every individual who got to the level of mastership was given a test. Just as Jesus was taken up to the desert, you know, and, and the, the devil, the back of your head, goes up to the desert, to the mountain with you. If you're God, throw yourself on these stones. <laughs> <laughs> if you're God, turn them stones into bread. You can do that. You can. <laughs> Understand something. It's in the back of your head. Your devil is following you around 24-7. Okay? All right. Now, we need to talk at this point about thought chemistry. And we need to understand the reality of thought chemistry. First, we need to know that thought is language, it is picture, and it is chemistry. Now, I finally brought one. I want everybody to look at this. Okay? Beautiful, round, wonderful lemon. Just as juicy, I'm squeezing the juice. And your glands are starting to kick, ain't they? Can you feel this in your glands right in here? Huh? Okay. J just from the picture, the image of a lemon, your gland begins making the correspondent chemistry that equates to a lemon. You can taste it. Okay. All thought makes chemistry. All thought makes chemistry. Okay. Very, very big, huge key. All thought makes chemistry. Okay. We are thought beings. The metaphysical school states we are thought in the mind of, of course they say God, but they mean in the mind of universal mind. We are a thought in the mind of universal mind. We already know the form, I won't go over that again, A-L-L-A-H, that, that's the image, the blueprint. We are the image and the likeness of God. The image is arm, leg, leg, arm, head. The likeness is the nature of divine nature, the nature of universal mind, the nature of supreme consciousness. We refer to as individuals, as soul or souls. We have the Creator's nature. Okay. Okay. Let me let me get on with this before I forget. Uh, Uma, you got a knife back there? I didn't. I meant to bring one and forgot it. And one of you uh, brothers, pull out your switchblade. You don't have to let it pop. Just reach in your back pocket. <laughs> The black man don't carry no switchblade no more. Too busy carrying a 357 Magnum. Uh-oh. 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 Yes, she is. We got one here. Thank you, my dear. <coughs> I want you to see this because we're talking again about... This is not a Macintosh apple. Yeah, it's not. Oh, Lord. Mm, I thought it was a Macintosh. It, this one has got six points in it. The Macintosh has perfect five-pointed star. Yeah, darn it. Oh, well. Next week, perhaps. It took me forever to get an apple here because I was in one of them little nickel-and-dime mom-pop oriental stores. <laughs> but we'll get to it in a minute. My commentary was to be with the star is based on this concept was what we are talking about in metaphysical terminology. Where's my eraser? Mm -hmm. 
Just like at home, I can't keep up with nothing, man. Have stuff right in front of me, can't even see it. I know somebody sees the eraser around here somewhere, huh? It's got to be right here in front of me because I didn't go off the table. Hold on. Where? That's a rag. I gotta. I don't want to wet the board. Well, I'll be darned. And what would I have done with the dam? <laughs> now, I shouldn't have went way back there with the eraser. Hmm? No, I just erased. Oh, incident. Okay, thank you, dear. Okay. Mm, mm, mm. Jim and I. Okay. This is what we want to look at. Who is... Egypt, Egypt is who? What's the synonym for Egypt? Anybody remember? Misra. That's right. Misraim, right. This is a codex inscriptus concept. It does not mean anything in the dictionary. Of course, the dictionary didn't give a meaning for it. it this does not mean, e this is not a translation of Egyptos, which means burnt skins or those of burnt skin. I don't know what people in the world would call themselves we are the ones of burnt skin. So we know that's a referendum from outside the community. Okay. This is Codex Inscriptus. That is what Egypt means. Again, we did we did the one seven. Two sevens, three sevens. We already did that, right? Remember that? Five and two is seven. That makes the four sevens. Five is what? Anybody remember? I can't take those down. That's five. That's two. When the Moors say their, their prayer, they hold up the, the five on the right and two on the left. Okay. Now, I don't know if they know what that means, but it's the moon and the sun, or the moon and man. Mother and son is what, what it means, which, of course, is seven, which is perfect being or perfect body. Okay? Okay, make sure you, you... You all were here when we did this little demonstration. Okay, all right, so make sure you, you're getting it all in there. Okay, let's go through these rather quickly. Uh, Simon the Canaanite is zeal, and of course, without zeal, you're not going to get much of anything done, which is at the Medulla Oblongata. This is the... Did I have it up? Let me have that one up there. Oh, okay. Now just look at this word. I'm running out of board here. Medulla, that's Allah, <laughs> oblongata. Now this word means long and narrow place, which is what the rest of the bulb of the brain is. It sits right beneath the cerebellum. subconscious part and this little bulb here sits right up under there okay that little bulb when your spirit quickens turns on just like a light bulb it usually is 
bronze, brownish, or if you if your stuff is clean inside, it, it comes out gold before it becomes the white light. Okay, but it's inside that instrument. There is on the astral a little cap. that comes open. It's the astral medulla oblongata that opens up and this substance flows into your spinal cord region that gives you this zeal. The zeal of thine house has eaten me up, Father. Yeah. It becomes overwhelmed with this passion. That's what most street preachers get. They get this zeal for the Lord. Yeah. Actually, it's a zeal to get something done, but all they know how to do is preach. You know, so they end up, usually don't do much because they don't know what to do with it. They get the energy and don't know what to do with it. I'm not finished with uh, medulla. I'm still working on it. The Spirit just broke that down for me today on the bus. I hadn't paid any attention. The medu, or medulla, that is, that is not a Latin word. I'm sure of it. I'm going to check it out, but I wanted to share that little information with Oblongata. That's the zeal that drives you forward. When it gets balanced, you are constantly, calmly driven forward to succeed at whatever goal you set. You, know, you can have 24 hours worth of energy. You can have 48 hours worth of energy. Or you don't get sleepy. You don't get tired. You know, and, and, and when you're when the queen of the south rises up, you, you'll have that experience. You won't even be able to sit down. <laughs> You've got to get up and do something. <laughs> okay. The zeal. The Canaanite, that's supposed to have been the, the one African. <laughs> the one African. Well, okay. We won't get in that argument. Philip is at the power center. Yes. Can we go through imagination? Uh... No, we didn't, but we should have. Thank you. Bartholomew, right. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's go right back up there to imagination. The image-making nation, if you look at the word imagination, image and this concept are the two concepts that makes up the word imagination. The people that live in our minds, are the people that belong to our individual mental nation. The people we love, the people we like, the people we relate to, the people we hate, the people we fear, the people we wish to get the hell out of our face. All those people live in each one of our minds. And each one of us must organize and rule over those people, over those mental individuals. That's your mental nation. And if you don't have control of it, they can give you cancer or arthritis because they can make you so angry. I'd kill that mom. Then your thought chemistry starts flowing with the poison to kill. And of course, his ears might start ringing or buzzing or burning, but, but the chemistry goes into your body. Well, why we need to understand that we make up this mental chemistry so that we know that we are poisoning our own bodies, that we are disrupting, rupturing our own kidneys, spleens, and pancreas. We're giving ourselves heart attacks by sending our blood racing through this universe at untold rates of speed, and it ruptures veins, arteries, capillaries, and aortas. Buses, blood vessels in the brain. The people that you see walking around like this, they did that to themselves. Their anger, their fury, their hatred. Okay? Why it's important to understand that you are the Lord of the earth. Understand that. And the earth you have is your body and you are to master it by mastering your thinking being able to change your thoughts 
allows you to change your chemistry. Okay. Okay. That's metaphysical mentality. Thank you for that. We, we talked about the power of imagination. The other law of mind in action is the psychological assumption. Write this down. The psychological assumption automatically provides the means to fulfill the dream desire. The psychological assumption automatically provides the means to fulfill the dream desire. The psychological assumption automatically provides the means to fulfill the dream desire. That is the law of mind in action. Remembering the law of mentalism, everything is mental. Everything begins as an image, as a thought, as an idea in the universal mind that we live, move, and have our being in. Which disciple is imagination? Bartholomew. He's the one Jesus said, Behold, I saw you beneath the fig tree even before you came to me which is a demonstration of what imagination is it is a part of your vision abilities Bartholomew one of the disciples of Jesus yes one Bartholomew yes one of the twelve was called Bartholomew no no that's another one no. Well, yeah, it's because your preacher never mentioned him. You know, it's it's kind of subtle. There isn't much that Bartholomew did, you know, because it isn't about the doing as much as it's about the knowing of the name. Remember, name means what? Nature. All right. Okay. By understanding the name, and that that's where the uh, the metaphysical dictionary helps you in appreciating this deeper level of this simplified concept of the gospel okay? because it gives you a, a clear definition. I, I don't want to stand here and read 12 names and take up 20 minutes doing that. Uh, your students, you're supposed to go get, have your tools, study. Don't, don't just write your notes, reread your notes. That's what a student does. Okay? All right. Got, okay, we're, okay, we're, we're going to go on now. We're not going to linger t too long. We dealt with zeal. Philip is power. The power of the spoken word is viewed in the, the gland right b at behind. Has anybody ever seen the back of their tongue? Have you ever had the experience of looking in the mirror, sticking your tongue out to see what, and open your mouth? You've seen these little mounds on top of the back of your tongue? Taste buds. Scary. I thought I had a disease. You know? I look there. And the spirit pulled my tongue out further than I usually could push it forward. Damn, what is that? <laughs> you know, but, but at even the tongue is, the human tongue is about that long because it fits down here. Yeah. It's really quite an instrument. <laughs> anyway, the, 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 the gland that attaches itself to the larynx in vocal cord center, this is your power center of spoken words that you can move things by speaking them. Peace, be still, and vibrate yourself and others at a certain point. And your spirit will give you a demonstration of that when, as your throat chakra opens up, which is the, the thymus gland here. Just right at these two little knots at the nape of your neck. Right behind there is your thymus gland. And behind that is this floral looking center called chakra, wheel, turning wheel, spinning wheel. We're dealing with physical faculties in the human body, is what we're talking about right now. Okay, th those are the apostles, the disciples, when they are cleansed, and quicken, then they become apostles or apostates of the body. Okay? That, that, that's the, the concept that we, we have to work with. The power of the spoken word. So it's important 
to say what you mean and not let your anger, your fear, your regrets, your hatred speak for you. Okay. It's important because you send something out with your spoken words. And, and, and if you want prosperity, you want good health, send those things out. Okay. And, and otherwise, bite thy tongue. <laughs> Okay, one, one day my spirit told me to do that. I used to be like a heck of a complainer, a mumbler. Bite that tongue. And then shut my mouth. <laughs> okay, I think we got all those in the head. There are five faculties in the head, seven in the body, <clears throat> which is how many? Thank you. Okay. The adrenal gland in the solar plexus area, this, this area up here, not down here, oh, my stomach hurts, and grabs his lower intestine. <laughs> that's the, and it's important to know that that's, if that's hurting, that that's what's hurting is your intestinal region, not your stomach. Okay, but that means you, you, you've got probably dried, stuff in there that's trying to turn because the intestinal tract is made like this, lays in the body like this. It is 20, 25 feet long. It's narrow because, the, the, not, not for the pork eater, he hasn't got big, the bro brothers with them big round stomachs, that, 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 that swollen intestinal tract. The ones with the stomach hanging, that's fat. But the ones that look like they got a basketball and a, a, a pregnancy going on, those, those are the ones with 30 and 40 and 50 pounds of dead waste that's been in their bodies 10, 12, 15, 20, 25 years. Well, that, no, it doesn't. When, when it pushes out like